and welcome to gagrule.net. Today in this episode, we bring you the lecture by Professor uh, George Bernutian uh, at the campuses of University of Irvine, Department of Humanity, and also Department of Armenian Study. And shortly, uh, Professor Doria is going to introduce the Dean of University of Irvine, and after that, he will introduce uh, Professor Bernutian. And the subject is Russo Iranian relation and the formation of modern Armenia. And as you could see, today Armenia has a little republic, even though between Russian Empire, Persian Empire, uh, they uh, quite a bit change, uh, hand, change, change hands between those two, but still they survive and uh, compare it to the brutality of the Turks, which is the majority, two-thirds of Armenia is Western Armenia. It's occupied by the Turks. And so uh, uh, please uh, uh, enjoy the, the lecture. And if you have any comment or questions, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. And here is uh, uh, Professor Daria to introduce uh, uh, the, the guest. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And before I introduce tonight's uh, speaker, uh, I would like to ask uh, the Dean of Humanities, uh, Professor George Van de Nabil, to say something about the future of Armenian studies at UCLA. Thank you, Viraj. Uh, can you hear me? This is sort of an odd way out. But, um, so, uh, good evening. Thank you for coming to the second lecture of the Bahrain Armenian Bumi Lecture Series of Armenian Studies uh, featuring George Bernuccian. And uh, we'll have a further introduction uh, before this talk. Um, before I say a few words about the future of Armenian Studies program at UC Irvine, I want to share a few highlights about the School of Humanities. Um, we are actually the largest school at UC Irvine by the number of departments, but also by the number of faculty, um, and actually the second largest in terms of enrollment. So uh, we are a sizable entity with about 1,900 students and 300 plus graduate students. Uh, our school touches nearly every student at some point in their UCI career. 70% of students enrolled in the rigorous year-long humanities core course for freshmen that we offer or in biological, physical, or social sciences. Uh, so we actually teach the whole campus. Some of our programs are among the highest ranked in the country, uh, including most recently uh, English number 22, history number 36, and philosophy number 23. Each of them rose five to six points in last, since last year's ranking. So we are moving up uh, all the time. Now, um, we also have particular strengths, as you may know, uh, in Persian-Iranian studies, in South Asian Indian studies, and Jewish-Israeli studies. We're about to launch a new Middle Eastern studies program whose focus will be deliberately transnational and global in understanding how the peoples and cultures of that broadly conceived area have contributed to our world, not only in the Near East and Middle East Central Asia, but throughout the world, in America, in Europe, and elsewhere. Um, we've also hired this past year a specialist in Russian history, and another one in Soviet art history with globally oriented perspective. So a discussion about Iranian-Russian um, formation in terms of modern Armenia is most in line with um, how we're moving strategically at UCI. Now, if any of you know, Armenian Studies at UCI was established in 2007 under the leadership of history professor Turaj Daryi, and he's here, of course, you know him, and assisted by the visionary volunteer efforts of Silvi and Garo Terzakian, uh, with the goal of providing classes in ancient and modern Armenian history to all interested students on a yearly basis. Initial course offerings to students began in 2008 and grew to offer public lectures such as this one aimed at bringing the history and cultural topics surrounding modern-day Armenia to the broader Orange County community. 
In the past seven years, this is a passionate idea that has turned into a growing and bustling program with exponential opportunities for growth. To further bolster that development, uh, we are presently in conversations with the American University of Armenia to create a partnership agreement between the two universities and hope to establish a memorandum of understanding between our universities within the next three weeks. Uh, we're hoping to have a meeting in Oakland to make this happen. Initial plans would include a faculty exchange program that will facilitate the sharing of educational resources between the two universities with plans to further expand into student exchange. No other university has capitalized on the deep relationship of the AUA to date with the University of California. We hope to spearhead that. In addition to that key collaboration, we're exploring avenues for further expanding Armenian language offerings that would reach beyond the UCI campus to the actual community and beyond. Furthermore, building upon a mutual interest in digital humanities, opportunity for collaboration with the American University in Armenia will include the development of a digital archive that will house the entire Armenian corpus of literature and languages. We have already established that kind of resource and that kind of project here at UCI with the Tesora Linguae Greca, which is the largest digital library of Greek literature in the world, and perhaps plans to do a similar one in Persian and Farsi literature. So to that effect, a digitized Armenian corpus would be a natural next step for us to take, and an immense resource for scholars and interested parties throughout the world. That would also allow us to further cement our prominence as a leader in this field of digital humanities. Finally, this isn't just talk. Um, we uh, already have a great deal of work taking place. Uh, just last week, one of our PhD students in comparative literature, Karim Jalatian, won a decade award to present his paper, The Problem of Realism and Post-Catastrophic <coughs> Diasporic Armenian Novel, A Case Study of Precor Baladian's Thresholds at the annual workshop of the Armenian Studies Program at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. This is, we have graduate students already working in this area, um, even as we're still launching the program. In that regard, I would like to um, announce a, uh, an, a very amazing, impressive pledge that uh, Vahe and Amin Meruni have made towards the possibility of an endowed chair here at UCI in Armenian Studies. Um, the university will match uh, part of that as we challenge the community to further match that and hope that we will be able to have that chair in place uh, a year from now in conducting the search. I think that that's a really exciting opportunity. And I think I want to thank Baha and Armin again for their tremendous generosity and support uh, in this program. Thank you. So that's to give you some sense of where we're going with Armenian studies um, here at Irvine very quickly and developing with a lot of speed and a lot of energy. I thank all of you for helping make that happen. And now I know I need to um, give the podium back to Professor Darye, who will introduce the speaker tonight. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to introduce Professor George Boumitian tonight. Since he was here last year, uh, I will not give the same introduction as I did, I think, as many of you were here, but rather speak about his importance uh, for the field of Armenian studies and the wider Near Eastern and Caucasus history. If you took the history of Armenia in the U.S. in the past uh, couple of decades, no doubt you would have had to take Professor Gourmetian's history of the Armenian people. I know I did. And if it was not for his tireless work, we would be in the dark. That is, for those who are not familiar with Armenian language, uh, the many important historical documents and texts that shed light on the history of Armenia and the surrounding world. With the exception of Professor Gourmetian, no historian with the exception of Professor Bournutian, no historian in the field has spent more time to translate and annotate historical documents for Armenia, Caucasus, and the Near East. 
Professor Bournoutian has published close to 30 books and the same amount of articles in peer-reviewed journals. Some of his recent books include Arakel of Tabriz, Book of History in 2010, and also the 1923 Russian survey of Karabakh province, a, or Artsakh, a primary source on the demography and economy of Karabakh in the 19th century. And I am seeing from Tabriz to St. Petersburg on the table, which is probably the latest publication of <coughs> Professor Bernitian. And that is amazing in itself in terms of the number of texts that he is producing. I should mention that it is also with the Mazda publishers here in Costa Mesa uh, that many of his books uh, on Armenia have been published and Dr. Conrad Jabari, the president of Mazda publishers there, mm -hmm. which I think Professor Ovanesian also publishes his Armenian series with him. So uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Bunutian, who will be speaking on Russo-Iranian relations and the formation of modern Armenia. Thank you very much. I don't think I need a microphone. Everybody can hear me. <laughs> that comes from teaching four classes every term. Mm -hmm. Our college is small, and they basically use us as indentured servants. <laughs> four lectures, four classes every term. Uh, I was very impressed, by the way, of the Armenian Studies program, all this magnificent news. Just to add, I've been invited by AUA hmm. with a Fulbright. Next, next year I'm on sabbatical. They invited me to start their Armenian history program in English. They have, they have had business and journalism and a few other things. But humanities right. is new. That's, right. That's why you've done a magnificent job to connect with them, because they have some very good students. I'm very, very happy. You're lucky. OK, today's lecture. I will refer to the map occasion. Most of you started going to Armenia, this new Armenia that we have since 1991, generally after the fall of the Soviet Union. Most Armenians in America went after, if you went a few years before. But the Armenia that you see today, maybe some of you don't realize how recent of a phenomenon it is. You know, we take it for granted that this Armenia has been there. The majority of the Armenian people by the 17th century and the 18th century were not in this part. They were on this side. Obviously. And that community, as you very well know, was destroyed during World War I. Almost nothing remains. Some ruined monuments. How this, this was created, this which was not at all part of majority of an Armenian place, how was this created? It has to do a lot with Iran and with Russia. Most of you know that Shah Abbas the Great brought between 100, depending who you believe, Arakel of Tabriz or others, between 100 and 150, some even go to 200,000 Armenians from this area, from the Yerevan, Nakhchivan, Bayezid, Kars area, into Iran. The group from Julfa was brought to New Julfa. But the rest of the Armenians, many of them stayed in Tabriz, Khoi, Maraz, in these areas, Marave, Tsamas, which is not on the map, and they remained there for a long, long time. <coughs> the condition of the Armenians under the Safavid dynasty was very, very good, up to the, almost the end of 1600. By the end of 1600s, things change. The last two Shahs, Shah Suleiman and especially Shah Sultan Hussein, turned against the liberal policies of their predecessors. I hate to use the term because it's very popular on TV, but they almost turned to fundamental Islam. 
and they began harassing the Armenians who were there. For almost 90 years now, Shah Abbas, Armenians built 17 churches in Isfahan and Jomfa. 17 of them. Mansions, palaces, they were doing very well. They were very close to the Shah. They were the Shah's merchants. Some of them were ambassadors for the Shah in Venice and France, etc., etc. This is not the lecture, it's another lecture. Yeah. So, they were doing very well, but then the things began to go sour. Some of the Armenians went to India and started a huge Indian Armenian community. A large number of them went to Russia, the Lazarians, and started the great Lazarian Institute and many Armenian merchants in Moscow and Petersburg. And the Lazarian Institute, they founded today, it's the Armenian embassy in Moscow, the building. So, complaints began going. Once the Armenians realized the good days are gone, they are looking for a protector. And obviously, the only Christian protector in that area, once you have to look at the map, would be Russia. The Armenians in Iran were not as active because most of them were merchants and the rest were farmers. The Armenians that were the most active were the Armenians of Karabakh. The Meliks of Karabakh, at the end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century, had the five Armenian mahals or districts, which today is the nagorno karabakh or Artsakh. These princes, they were petty princes. They had their own armies. They were surrounded by Muslims. But the five mahals, and we have the book that you mentioned, we have the Russian survey a little bit later, 96.7% of the five mahals were Armenian. There were only two Tatar villages. There was no such word as Azeri. They were known as Tatars. So they were the ones who began writing, because this was all part of Iran. The Safavids controlled everything you see. Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, all of Iran, almost all of Afghanistan, half of Pakistan, and a large part of Iraq was the Safavid Empire, the Iranian Empire. Their biggest enemy being the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Once the situation changed, it's these Armenians, the Meliks, who began writing to Russia. We have the letters. I have translated all this material in two of my books. Unfortunately, the one that has these is sold out, and you can't get it. Even my publisher doesn't have it. And eBay has ridiculous prices of $600. I wish I had kept a few copies. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? So, the letters to Peter the Great we have. Melik Sabgarabah collectively wrote 12 letters to Peter the Great, asking him to come and liberate them, to help them. Now, that in fact, some of them wrote, we even have Armenian troops ready. We will pay for your troops. We will give them food and provisions. And we have 10,000 volunteers, armed volunteers, ready for you. Peter was busy with his Swedish war, that famous war with Sweden. After he finished it in 1721, a year later, he took their word and attacked from there. Going first to Darbad, it's up there, the Caspian Sea, and coming towards Baku. Armenians of Karabakh were ecstatic. The 10,000 volunteers gathered. The Georgian king, Georgians had a king, Christian, also gathered his troops and went towards Ganja here, waiting for Peter to come. Peter started coming south, great success. What he did not anticipate is the Ottoman Turks. The Ottoman Turks would not allow Russia to come to their back door. This is the back door of the Ottoman Empire. Kars, what is Western Armenia, Iraq, they didn't want Russia to come in. So the Ottomans invaded. They invaded Yerevan, they invaded Nakhchivan, they took Tiflis, they even reached Ganja. Russia and the Ottomans almost went to war over this area. The French ambassador intervened. In 1724, Russia and the Ottomans signed an agreement dividing the Caucasus. And the line is exactly as you see here. 
Basically, this became the Turkish area. This became the Russian area. The mountains of Karabakh, the Meliks of Karabakh fought the Turks themselves. But the Turks occupied Yerevan, Nakhchivan, Ganja, and Georgia. Russia occupied this side. Armenians were betrayed, Georgians were betrayed. Peter basically did not carry his promise. Many of those volunteers who were waiting for Peter crossed the border into Russia and joined Peter's army. Later on, there are special Armenian squadrons and Georgian squadrons in the Russian army up to Catherine II. For the next hundred years, separate squadrons. They never came back. They became Russified, their children became Russian citizens, some of them served in the Russian army to high positions, another story. The only ones who resisted the Turks were the five Meliks of Garabagh. And we have records, eyewitness accounts, that the Turks for 12 years tried to attack, but they couldn't get it. The highlands of Garabagh the Armenian Meliks put the women and the children into baskets and raised them up into the ravines in the caves and they fought them for 12 years. Turkish records say that they lost, the Turkish army had the biggest losses in this area. The rest, they didn't have much of a problem. The situation continued like this until Nader Shah, the great Iranian, new Iranian ruler who starts a new dynasty. He kicks the Turks back. He pushes the Russians out, and by the time he gets his crown, the coronation, all this area is back under Iranian rule again. So nothing changed. The 12-year fiasco, except of killing people and ruining houses, went to exactly the same borders of 1722. Now that didn't last long. He was assassinated. It doesn't matter. This is not that part. And then another ruler comes in in Tabriz in the south. I mean, Shiraz, Sali in the south. He doesn't last long. And then finally, a new dynasty comes to Iran, the last dynasty before the Pahlavi, before our Shahs, the last Shahs, the Qajars, 1780s to 1924. It's the Qajars that now face Russia and the Ottoman Empire. But we're mainly going to talk about Russo. Iranian relations and the creation of this new Armenia. Catherine the Great, long after Peter is gone, Catherine the Great follows Peter's ideas. Her plan is to take over the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea on that corner. Okay? The first thing she does is she conquers the Crimea. You've heard the news, Putin, Crimea, this, that, okay? I'm not a fan of Putin, but Crimea belongs to Russia. Absolutely. I don't care if you're going to go up and down, commit harakiri, it won't make anything. It's been part of Russia from Catherine the Great's time, okay? It was Khrushchev that in a moment of drunkenness, he's Ukrainian himself, yes. <laughs> gave it to Ukraine. 1954. Yeah. Thinking, well, the Soviet Union is not going to collapse. Okay? It's never going to collapse. It's going to be the same. Nobody predicted, nobody in their right mind could predict something like that could happen that the Soviet Union would collapse. And this would happen. All right, so. I'm not, as I said, I'm not a fan of Putin, but historically, it is part of Russia. I've been to Crimea many times. I've been to Ukraine many times. Almost no one in Ukraine speaks U Ukrainian. They all speak Russian, and especially in Crimea. So this, it's uh, very strange that suddenly it became such a big thing. <laughs> now, what happens is, after Crimea, Catherine makes a deal with King Heracle of Georgia, the famous Treaty of 1783. It places Georgia under Russian protection. The Treaty of Georgievsk, or Georgievsk. A very important treaty. We have it, it's been translated. So, the new Shah of Iran, Agha Muhammad Khan, the first Qajar, okay, is a eunuch. 
although his nephew continues the dynasty. Otherwise, it will be a miracle. So, <laughs> and he was a eunuch, but uh, Fatali Shah, this guy with a nice beard here, he, he makes up for his uncle. He had 117 wives and God knows how many children. I think over 100 some children. So he makes up for, for uncle. Now, Allah Muhammad Khan gets very angry because technically, all this belongs to Iran. Now, the king of Georgia, who is the vassal of Iran, has made a treaty of protection with Russia. Aram Ahmad Khan sends him a letter. We have the letter. I have translated it. He says, you, since the Safavids, you have always been our governors there. We've made you governors. Vali, Vali of Gurdjistan. You are governors. You are not even kings. How dare you, without our permission, make a deal? If you don't come back, I'm coming with an army. Heracle writes a letter to Catherine immediately. We have that letter too. It was translated in one of my books. He says, look, I got this letter from Iran. He's marching in. Catherine asks her advisors, who is this guy? <laughs> there's so many new, because there are so many new people coming in and out. Iran is in chaos. This is a new new guy that's just organizing, reorganizing Iran after all those assassinations. Her advisors say that he's one of these guys, they have so many of them, they're these Khans, and I wouldn't pay attention to him, he's a eunuch anyway. Okay. <laughs> Catherine ignores, does not send her army to protect. Tiflis, even though Russia has a signed agreement to protect it with an army, no Russian army arrives in Tiflis. In 1795, Aram Ahmad Khan and his army arrives in Tiflis. Heracle escapes to the mountain. He burns half the city. He burns a lot of churches. Takes 15,000, and this is Iranian records, 15,000 slaves, prisoners, and brings them back to Iran, especially women. Georgian women were very popular in Iranian harems. And they were kind of Georgian and Circassians. Very good looking, apparently. I wasn't there. So, <laughs> what happens is he brings them there. It's in that day, in 1795, that Sayyad Nova is killed. Those of you who are Armenian or who know Sayyad Nova, he was a very famous Ashur, a bard. You know? He was, by the way, that's another misnomer. Many Armenians think he only wrote in Armenian, not true. He has many songs and poetry in Turkish, in Persian, in Georgian, and Armenian. He truly was a diverse person. I mean, we consider him Armenian because he was Christian, that's true. He was, he came to the, apparently, how accurate this is a legend, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. They brought him close to this Aram Ahmad Khan. They said he's magnificent. He even recited some poetry in Turkish, which Aram Ahmad Khan knew, Azeri Turkish and Persian. And the Khan said, I will make you a court poet if you convert. Well, the legend story says that he did not convert and he was put to death. And those of you who've been to Tiflis, his grave, his tomb is outside the old Armenian church, not the new one, but the old one right outside. So that's the story of this. Catherine then gets very angry, embarrassed, sends an army. By the time the army arrives, and once again the Armenians are excited, the Georgians are excited, this time a major army is coming to liberate us. I'm talking about only these Armenians and these Georgians, nothing to do with the Turkish side, where the majority of Armenians lived. Okay? By the time the army reaches even outside Ganja, Catherine dies, 1796. Her son, Emperor Paul, hated his mother. And there is a reason, obviously, Catherine had killed the father. Catherine was a German princess, she wasn't Russian. She married Peter III. After a few years, again, depending who you believe, Peter was not a good husband. He caroused a lot, he drank a lot, whatever. Catherine got rid of him with her lovers. They killed him. And she became the empress. 
before he was killed, she had a son, Paul with Peter. Some say it wasn't even Peter's son. It doesn't matter. There was no DNA in those days. So she never liked Paul. She sent Paul away to a separate palace. Catherine never married. She had lots of illegitimate children, and she had a lot of lovers. And all her lovers uh, were fantastic generals and truly served her well. I'm not talking about the other service. I'm talking about <laughs> the army. They were fantastic. They were the ones who conquered Crimea for her. They were the ones who did fantastic victories against the Turks and so forth and so forth. Agha Mehmet Khan now got very angry that Russia is sending the army. He decides to march in from Karabakh and empty all the Christians from this area and send them to Afghanistan and Khorasan. We have the Iranian chronicler, his own secretary, saying that. This is one of the few times Armenians and the Christians got lucky. He was in Karabakh in Shusha, 1797, ready to do the attack, where he is assassinated at night by two of his slaves. He is killed. And there is chaos in Iran until the nephew takes over. Catherine is dead. Paul rules only for a few years. The Russian nobility don't like him. They enter the castle one day, which strangle him. Catherine's grandson, now we come to the story. Catherine's grandson, Alexander I, continues grandma's plan. First thing he does in 1801, annexes Georgia. Georgia gets annexed, which is not what the Georgian kings wanted. Originally, the Georgian kings, and we have all their petitions, they wanted to rule under Russia, to remain as a dynasty. Alexander annexes it, but worse than annexing, he sends a Georgian Russian prince, one of those Georgians that years ago in Peter had gone into the Russian service, General Tsitsianov. He's Georgian himself, but he's a Russian speaker. His duty was, and we have the letter from the Tsar to him, the minute you arrive to Tiflis, gather the entire Georgian royal house, mother, queen, princes, exile them into Russia. And that's what they did. Two princes escaped to Iran and caused problem later against the Russia, but for all intents and purposes, the Georgian dynasty, which is the Bagration dynasty, the Armenian Bagratuni, which had intermarried Georgian and became the Bagration family, the famous general Bagration you read in War and Peace. If you remember, he dies fighting Napoleon. So, this... Georgia is the next. Tsitsianov then gets an order. Finish all these Muslim Khanates. There were nine Khanates. Khanate of Talesh, Khanate of Garabah, Khanate of Shirvan, Khanate of Sheki, Khanate of Kuba, Khanate of Baku, okay? Khanate of Yerevan, Khanate of Nakhchivan. <coughs> this should be the border. The Arax River. This was the plan. There are many Georgians here, there are Armenians here. <coughs> Let's clean them up. Not clean the Muslims. Get rid of the Khans. Incorporate this into the Russian Empire. Because it's close to the Caspian Sea. It's close to the Ottomans for future wars with the Turks. Road to Constantinople. That was the plan. Tsitsianov begins. 1804, the first Russo-Iranian War. 1804 to 1813. Now you would say, why did it take so long? One of the reasons it took so long is Russia, if you remember, 1805, Napoleon, uh, 1807, Treaty of Tilsit, 1812, Napoleon invades Russia. So Russia was not spending too much of its army here. But slowly, most of this, except for Yerevan and Nakhchivan, what becomes known as the Armenian province, this, Yerevan and Nakhchivan, all the others eventually Russia conquers. And by the Treaty of Golestan, or 
Gulistan, 1813. What is today Azerbaijan plus nagorno karabakh and Georgia officially surrendered to Russia? The only thing that remains for Iran is Yerevan province and Nakhchivan province. That's it. It's the only thing that remains. Peace is restored, but it doesn't last long. Because the next governor after Tsitsianov, Yermolov, he truly does not like Muslims. His first duty is to go as an ambassador to Iran to negotiate exact border delineation of the Treaty of Turkmen uh, Gulistan. He arrives there, he insults the prince, the heir to the throne. He goes to see the Shah. He refuses to take his shoes off. Because remember, Iranians, not, not today as much, but in those days, Iranians ate and slept on their carpets. Okay? There were no chairs. There were divans. You sat on the carpet and you slept on the carpet. To this day, many Iranians, when they go to, to the house, they take their shoes off. Just like the Japanese. You don't walk with shoes from the dirty street. I do it at my house, and I'm Armenian, but I got that habit. And I make a big fuss if somebody walks in. I have slippers all over the place. <laughs> Don't walk in. Okay? So, he refused. He comes with his boots, dusty boots from the horse ride, walks into the shop in presence of the shop, and on top of that, he sits on a chair. Nobody sits in front of the shop. Well, it was unpurposely done. He then goes back, and his next project is to make life so difficult for these Khans. All these Khans have surrendered to Russia. Russia originally said, as long as you surrender, and it's under Russian jurisdiction, you can remain Khans. You can keep your palace, you can collect some of the taxes. He starts treating them so badly that they would flee. All of them fled to Iran. And the next thing he does, and that's the book you were talking about. The next thing he does, he sends Russian officials to conduct surveys, counting which villages are Christian, which villages are Muslim, which are Kurds, which are nomads, how much taxes are they paying. All these records he gathers. Unfortunately, he only manages to do it for three Khanids. Araba, which I have translated, Shirvan, and Shaki. I translated the Araba. I just got the Shirvan, and the Shaki is coming. These are very rare surveys, three, four hundred pages each, written in very st static, bureaucratic, 19th, early 19th century Russian orthography. Translating the Araba took year, a few years. But it's extremely important, not because it's Armenia, it's extremely important to see what taxes were people paying, to whom, where they were, and so the Garabagh one is out. And the reason it's important today, the first survey was 1819, the second was 1820, the Garabagh was 1823 that uh, Dr. Daryai mentioned. The reason it's important is because present-day Azerbaijani government insists, the scholars, some of their professors, that Armenians that I mentioned, 96.6%, arrived here only after 1828, which I'm going to discuss the Treaty of Turkmen Chai, that there were no Armenians there at all. Now, this is five years before 1828. It was conducted by Russians. It has nothing to do with Armenians. And the only reason it was conducted is to see how much money will now go to the central treasury. The conductors were Russians. And so uh, this book was published, and I sent a copy to Azerbaijan Academy of Sciences. <laughs> said, said, you know, there's, uh, I mean, I'm not a nationalist, but you know, don't, don't make ridiculous statements. All right? It's, most of Karabakh is Azerbaijan, just this little part. Karabakh is a big province. What Armenians are saying is just a little five districts. They're not talking about everything else. 
all of the Khans escaped. They complained to the Shah. One of the Ayatollahs from Iraq, which is the main Shiite center of Najaf and Karbala, told the Shah, how dare you have all these Muslims living under infidel Christians. You have not done your duty. They pressed the Shah. In 1826, Iran started the second war. The first one was started by the Russians, started by Iran. And it was good timing. 1825, late 1825, Tsar Alexander dies outside the capital, somewhere in the Black Sea area, Taganrog. He had no children. Nobody knew who was going to serve, who is going to succeed. He had a brother after him, the second in line, Constantine, who was the governor of Poland. Poland after Napoleon, most of it went to Russia. Poland disappeared from the map. So, the officers swear loyalty to Constantine, who is in Poland. There is no telegraph, no telephone, no email. They sent couriers to Poland. They arrive, your majesty says, I have told you I am not interested in becoming czar. We have decided to give it to our younger brother, Nicholas. The paper is somewhere in the, this part of the palace. Nobody knew. So during this chaos in December of 1825, where Russia has no government, a number of Russian liberal officers go out in St. Petersburg with posters demanding a constitution and a parliament. That early, they had already gone to France, they had seen the French Revolution, the revolutionary ideas, the liberal ideas, and they wanted the same thing to happen to Russia. Russia still had serfs. Russia was the only country in Europe that until 1863 had served them. It's unbelievable. European, but very Asiatic, very backward in this kind of things. They found the paper. Nicholas is proclaimed czar. He sends the army. They shoot some of the Decembrists. They are known as Decembrists, the Gabristi. And so the news arrives in Iran that Russia has no government. But again, things are late by the time. So Iran attacks, initially great success. All these Muslims who were fed up with Yermolov's policy join the Iranians, and the Iranian army takes back Ganja, is marching towards Tiflis, <coughs> takes all of this area, reaches Shushi, the fortress of Shushi. Armenian and Russians in Shushi Defend. Shushi doesn't fall. The Tsar realizes the situation is bad. He blames Yermolov. He sends a new general, Paskevich, 1827. Paskevich brings much better army, much pre better prepared with fire, with cannons. Iran is defeated very soon. By the end of 27, Iran. All of this is taken. Yerevan, Nakhchevan, this area that was not part of Russia is taken. And the Russian army reaches Tabriz, the capital of Iranian province of the heir apparent. The heir is there. Tehran is the main capital, but this is the capital of this entire area. And Iran surrenders. The Treaty of Turkmen Chai, very important, February 1828. That's the treaty that to this day the Iranians do not forget. You ask anybody in Tehran Bazaar, you ask anybody who's gonna, they, we were cheated by Turkmen Chai. Turkmen Chai has almost become a, synonymous with bad news. To this day, all right, what did it do? Not only it took away Yerevan and Nakhchevan, but they took the southern part of Talesh. Look, the Arax River goes this way. Technically, the border should be here. Okay? But even Talesh, which is below the Arax, was taken, which is very important for the Caspian Sea. Astara, Lenkora, Lenkoran, is there. Second, Iran promised not, Iran could not use any naval 
ships on the Caspian Sea. Third, first time Iran agreed to capitulations, ex-territorial rights. That means Russian citizens, I'm nothing but diplomats, Russian businessmen, Russian merchants, Russian, any Russian that's official that's there in Iran was not subject to Iranian law if they did something wrong. It's a very normal imperialistic thing that the British did in China, the French did in other places, that our citizens are nothing but diplomats. Our citizens cannot be touched by your law because you are savages, basically. Your law is not good enough. You don't have our habeas corpus. You don't have trial by jury. You don't have this. You don't have a civil law. And you are following Sharia law. And so we don't trust your law. And this is first time capitulation arrives in Iran. Very bad for Iran. The only good thing that happened, and in a way it's bad and good, to make it a little bit palatable, the Russians agreed that this guy, Abbas Mirza, the heir to the throne, would be guaranteed. He was the one who signed. He was the commander of the Iranian army. So to make life easy for him, they promised him that the Shah had 72 boys. Any of those boys could have been coming in and taking over. He wasn't the first son. The first son was from a Georgian concubine. So therefore, he was put aside. He was from a Qajar princess. So although he was the fourth son, he was designated heir apparent. The Treaty of Turkmenchai, Article 3, guarantees that no matter what happens, the minute his father <laughs> dies, he will be king. Russia guarantees it. Russian army guarantees it. That this guy. And if he dies, and that's so interesting, his children are going to inherit. And that's exactly what happened. Abbas Mirza dies a year before his own father. And when his father died, the eldest son of Abbas Mirza continues the dynastic line to 1924. So that's the good part. The bad part, of course, is Russia guaranteed Iranian security. From now on, no one from the Ottoman Empire, no one can attack Iran because Russia guarantees Iranian security. A few years later, the British guaranteed Iranian security in the Persian Gulf. And so the Qajars never had any problem building an army. Iran went, went 100 years until Reza Shah came in. Tehran had no electricity. Tehran had no running water. Tehran had very few streets, whereas Istanbul at that time was, had tram cars and all sorts of things. Tehran, Iran fell back because of that. Now we come to the creation of modern Armenia. Article 15 of the Treaty of Turkmen Chai extremely important. That was done because during the war, a lot of Russian officials who were pro-Armenian <laughs> all these years, Catherine the Great, Peter the Great, Armenians who were writing the Lazarians in, in Moscow and Petersburg, gave Catherine a lot of presents and jewels. So Armenians had a good connection. Russian diplomats began thinking somehow to create this into an Armenia. When the war was going on, Second War, the Armenian Bishop of Tiflis, Nerses of Ashtarak, gathered Armenian volunteers. Because during all this chaos, 15,000 Armenian families had gone to Georgia and settled in Georgia. Until the Russian Revolution, Tiflis had more Armenians than Georgians. The capital of Georgia, the majority were Armenians. And to this day, they haven't forgot, forgiven or forgotten us for that. Because they don't like us because of that. Because Armenians had the businesses and everything, and the Georgians basically didn't do as well as the Armenians. So, nurses gathered Armenian volunteers. They even made a flag. We have the picture of a very interesting flag with Ararat 
and a few other things. And they marched together, liberated Echmiadzin. Echmiadzin, the holy see of Echmiadzin, was liberated by Armenian volunteers who marched with the Russian army. And so when the war was over, because of nurses, because of Russian diplomats, because of all the pressures, Article 15 was put in the Treaty of Turkmenchai. Very interesting article. All Armenians from Iran, but mainly from here, the Armenians that 200 years ago, their grandfathers and great-grandfathers were forcibly exiled, have one year time to sell everything they have, movable, that is, immovable, you have no choice, sell houses, etc., put it on carts with their donkeys and cows and whatever, and move across the Arabs into what became known as Armenian province. Armianskaya Oblast, Haikakan Mars, Yerevan and Nakhchevan. Now, today Nakhchevan is not ours, but that's a long different story. So, this was the new Armenian province. In the meantime, Muslims could move out. So basically, it's population exchange transfers. And that's exactly what happened. By 1829, 1830, it was finished. And we have statistics. Russians took a survey of Yerevan and Nakhchevan before and after this immigration. Before the immigration, the population of Yerevan Nakhchevan combined was barely 30% Armenian. So the Armenia of today, barely 30%, some even say less. Not mainly because Shah Abbas had moved all those thousands, the wars had created refugees all over. That's why, it's not because Armenian population had shrunk. This is where the main Armenian population was. 70% were either Kurds or Turkish-speaking tribes. Most of them were nomads. Once the population transfer occurred, by 1830, we have the records too, because the beautiful thing that the Russians did is they have records of native Armenians, Armenian immigrants from Iran, Armenian immigrants from Turkey, because a year later Russia had a war with the Turk, short war, and Armenians from Kars immigrated there too. So by 1830, the population of the Armenian province is 52% Armenian, 48% Muslim. So it's not that high yet. Okay, so this is the Armenia that we have. And it continued like that until 1840. 1840, the Saint Tsar Nicholas comes to see Ararat. Ararat, Noah, etc. He was a very conservative man. He was a Russophile. He didn't like anything. So the first thing he does when he comes, he looks at the map. He says, what is this? Georgian province, Armenian province. This was known as the Muslim province. This he didn't mind. But Armenian, Georgian, this is the Russian Empire. I don't like it. Remove it. Okay? So these two were combined into Imeretian Georgian something for four year, five years. Five years later, a new governor who was a little bit more diplomatic changed it. Instead of Armenian province, this became known as the Yerevan province, combined. And it remained as the Yerevan gubernia until the fall of the Russian Empire in 1917. That was the name. The Armenians, however, most of them, the immigrants were mostly farmers. 200 families went to Garaba, that's all. The rest all came here. So when the Azeris are saying that there was no Armenians here until later, all Armenians from Iran came to Garaba. We have the Russian records, 200 families only went here. The rest all came here and created a small Armenian majority. The problem with this area was the main city was not Yerevan. The main city was Alexandropol, Gyumri. That's where the train lot, train never went came. <laughs> train went from Tiflis to Gyumri, from Gyumri to Kars. That's the train. Nobody cared about this. This was the backwater. 
the Armenians, most Armenians, the <laughs> businessmen, the intellectuals didn't want to live here. The ones who were intellectuals and were businessmen went to Tiflis. Many of them went to Baku, where the oil fields were, and many Armenian millionaires. In. Some of them went to Russia, Nalbalian and others, Petersburg. The only Armenian intellectual that remained here was Abovian, and he didn't live long. That's it. One Abovian. Rafi, all the Armenian pantheon, the great Armenian writers are all buried in Tiflis. If you go to Tiflis, there's Armenian cemetery. The entire Armenian pantheon is buried there. Okay? I, I know. So this was not. Even after the fall of the Russian Empire, when the Armenian Republic, the short Armenian Republic for two years was formed from here, and Armenians later went to Paris to demand the greater Armenia, you know, the map, etc., President Wilson, we have the statistics of the Armenian government. Even in 1919, Armenians formed only 67% of this area, of the Armenian Khanate, of the Yerevan province, 67%. It's better. Whereas in Tiflis, the city of Tiflis had the Armenian majority. Armenians were doing much better outside of Armenia. In fact, when the Armenian government was established in 1918, the entire Armenian cabinet, the Armenian presidents, etc., had to come from Tiflis in May 1918, by car, carriage, bicycle, however they made it, to create an Armenian government. Nobody was, Yerevan was nothing. Yerevan had one avenue, and one broken hotel called London Hotel. Why London Avenue? <laughs> <laughs> we think big. Okay? So, and and it remained like that until 1920, when, as you know, the Bolsheviks from one side, the Turks from another side, attacked Armenia. Armenia lost a great deal. The most important thing, it lost Surmalu with Mount Ararat. That was always in Persian Armenia. That was part of the Khanate of Yerevan. It lost Big Ararat. Small Ararat remained in Iran until 1934. I just finished an article. I sent it to Iran and the Caucasus. It will come out soon. Most maps make a mistake. They put Small Ararat. Small Ararat remained in Iran until 1934 when Reza Shah met Ataturk, and the border was adjusted. Iran gave Small Ararat to the Turks in exchange for Qotur and a few other villages in Lake Urbia, even exchange, although strategically this is much more important than the few villages around Khotur, but Reza Shah said, let's not argue, he was very impressed with Ataturk. So little Ararat has gone to the Turks only in 1934. Armenia lost Azerbaijan because Armenia had lost the war to the Turks, and the Bolsheviks agreed with the Turks all the demands of the Turks. Nakhchivan was separated from Armenia, given as an autonomous region to Azerbaijan. Nagorno-Karabakh became an autonomous region within Azerbaijan. The only good thing that happened for Armenia is because Armenians were very involved in militarily, was the region of Zangezur, here this little thing. Moscow eventually agreed that it should go to Armenia. And now, Nakhchivan is separated from the rest of Azerbaijan by this corridor, the Zangezur Corridor. Armenia also gained a few areas in, from Georgia, Borchalu, Lori. So the border of Armenia today goes up to Alaverdi, a little bit north of Alaverdi. And that's how Armenia remained. And if you like the Soviet Armenia, if you don't like Soviet Armenia, it doesn't make any difference. Armenia of today was built by the Soviets. Okay? The opera, the city, the entire infrastructure, the university, the airports, 
the stadiums, okay, the Matanadara. All right? You may not like the Soviet Union, and I don't, I'm not a big fan of it, but you have to realize that the Armenia that you see today was built slowly, not even 1921. It was from 1930 onwards that Tamanyan and others built this Armenia and invited many Armenians from Georgia, later Armenians from Baku, some Armenians from Karabakh who left, Armenians from Greece, from Syria, from Lebanon, from Egypt after World War II, repatriated Nergach, repatriated, and we created this Armenia which by 1991 had 93% Armenian population, some even say higher, and they all spoke Armenia. So this is the creation of the modern Armenia is a new thing. Because every time you look at it, you think, well, Armenia, we're 3,000 years old. Yes, we are 3,000 years old. But this modern Armenia that you see today was created barely 80 years ago. And population-wise, started really going only after 1860s, 1870s, and certainly after Sovietization. Without that, you wouldn't have had it. Okay. I know many people did not like Soviet Armenia, etc. They were complaining. Yes, it's true it wasn't the best place in the world. But without that, we would have had nothing because the main population was here. And you know what happened here. If this was not created after the Treaty of Turkmen Chai by Article 15, and if the immigration was not done, and if the church wasn't involved, and the Russian, by the way, the Russian government paid every family that went there 100 silver rubles for resettlement. So there was an economy plan. It was a planned creation. I'm not saying this was never part of Armenia. It is Armenia. It's historic Armenia. But historic Armenia, you can go all over. You can say, okay, this is historic, that's historic. That historic Armenia doesn't mean anything without population or buildings. I can give you all of California and say this has been historic Armenia. What does that mean? Nothing. Of course we all want one day to have the great Armenia again. But without that, first you need people to populate it and to build it. Wanting something is very easy. Building it. These people built it with all its problems. Armenian painters, Armenian composers, Armenian theater, everything you are so proud of today was done after 1921. Okay? Even if you don't like Soviets. Okay? So remember that. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you have any questions and comments, as I said, uh, contact us and, and we'll see you in our next episode. Have a nice day.